We're going to talk about vaccines today and different approaches for promoting them to the public. Um, we'll start, uh, what we do is we usually start by doing a two minute introduction from everyone just to check in and see how you're doing. We started this during the coronavirus. Um, <clears throat> just helps everyone kind of decompress a little bit and share how your station's doing, how you're doing. Um, and then when, when we're done with that, uh, we'll, we'll talk with um, Michael White and I'll, I'll save him for the end. I'll, I'll, I'll introduce him. So um, why don't we start with Davine today? How are you doing over there in uh, Asheville? Doing well. No complaints, forging ahead, that's about it. <laughs> day by day. Yep, taking it a day at a time. I'll pass it, I'll pass it to Eugene. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we're, we're doing okay. Um, we had our financial meeting the, the other day and uh, I think I would say individual donations are down, but We've gotten more in the way of um, of some kind of uh, airtime airtime sponsorships purchased for um, making nonprofits in the Columbus area more visible to the community. So that that's working pretty good. Um, we're fortunate though that we have our own we we own our own land that the tower is on, and we own the tower. So we, we don't have to pay rent or anything. And um, we, I think we can go on um, uh, sustainably, you know, at this lower level, luckily. So unless something breaks, <laughs> which actually it did uh, uh, two weeks, uh, three weeks ago, we had one of those huge uh, wind storms, 70 mile an hour winds, blew a dead tree down over the power line to the station. So we lost power and the neighbor lost power and it, it, it pulled out their electrical um, uh, weatherhead from their building and started a fire in their, in their um, attic. This was the neighbor to our, our radio property. So luckily the fire uh, people got there right away and put it out. So it wasn't too bad, uh, but we were without power for two days. <laughs> Well, that's good news that everything's okay. Yeah. And you look healthy, so that's good news too, right? Yeah, I, I had a, a negative test one week after the positive COVID test. All right. And then today I went and got a second test, and I'll know in three days, because I don't, you know, there's a lot of false negatives uh, that can happen, so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that sounds encouraging, at least. Yeah. <laughs> Um, do you want to pass it on, Eugene, to someone else? How about Doug? Is Doug still here? Yeah, yeah. Doug, where where are you from? Your station looks familiar. Uh, Kaku, 88.5 uh, Maui. Oh, Maui. Oh, K cool. Welcome, K -A -M -U. Doug. K-A-M-U. K-A-M-U? Yeah. No, K-K-U. Um, no, it's Kaku. K-A-K-U. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, you yeah. Used, to, used to air. We used to listen to you uh, when we went to Hawaii every year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful. You had yeah. wonderful Hawaiian music uh, a few years ago, and now I think it's changed a little bit. But go ahead, Dave. Doug. Yeah, we do a lot of we do some reggae and um, different things, a lot of talk shows. Uh, but yeah, we're doing well. Okay, <clears throat> good deal. Well, it's nice to have going, you. Uh, Glad you could uh, join us. Trying to bring some producers back into the. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for uh, the invite. Yeah, you bet. I do, uh, let's see, have we heard from Joseph? No, we have not yet. Hello? Am I on? Yes. Hi, Joseph. It's it's all you. It's all me. All right. So that's the way I like it. I'm, I'm here in Hoopa, California, Northern California, Humboldt, Eastern Humboldt County, center of the world. I like that palette behind you, Doug. Yeah. Used to make those in my prime years, and uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, I'm the lead producer now. I switched over, stepped aside from being the manager, although I'm still doing a lot of managing. But uh, trying to get away from that and do more 
production, so that's why I've been missing a few of these calls because I got deadlines like tomorrow. I just recorded a raw material this morning. I just segmented it just before we got on this meeting and I want to hear this meeting, the topic here because, well, we're, we're involved in, our numbers are really down. We only have one active case right now, although there may be about 24 people who have are still going through that isolation process. So. Oh, that's good we're, news. We're doing well, and we want to keep our numbers low. And yes, we're hearing all kinds of messages about uh, vaccinations. And we have a twice a week, our tribal chairman comes on. He brings on a, a task force of the Office of Emergency Services uh, Incident Command Team, which also includes our clinic. Where we have doctors and emergency personnel here reporting on the updates and they keep their they keep their finger on the pulse, what's going on here locally and all the counties around us. So all the counties around us are either in red or purple. And we're just getting to the fringe of yellow or orange type of a level. But we're a small community, so having one more active case is very significant. And if we get two or three, man, now, now we're going to go back into the red. So we're trying to keep those numbers down and you see behind me is actually the studio where the chairman has his uh, program and we record it live or we broadcast it live and he takes calls, call-ins and emails and we took the tables out of the studio, put in separate chairs so we're all six foot minimum uh, social distancing. At uh, two minutes. And I'm at two minutes and that's all I got to tell you for now. <laughs> so let's take it on to... Um, uh, well, Ursula's out of the way. Uh, who else we got here? And Michael, you're holding. James, how are you doing, James? Good. Um, KCBP, we're in Modesto, California, which is about 70 miles south of Sacramento. Um, we're all volunteers. Struggling. We're new, getting a lot of new volunteers. So we're, uh, the COVID's put our fundraising <laughs> into a uh, tailspin so we're, we're still on still trying um another reason i came on was the i'm a pediatric <laughs> physician assistant and i have a lot of vaccination experience so i wanted to kind of see how this was going to go oh wonderful james i'm so glad you could join us let's see um who else do we got how about Clyde. Good morning. Hi, Clyde. Afternoon. How are you? <clears throat> Good. I'm with uh, uh, Davis Media Access in Davis, California, and this is the first time I've been here, and uh, I'm on the production committee there, and uh, we have closed the station down to all volunteers, so most of us are doing our shows from home, and uh, we're using various of the apps to do that. And uh, I work with a guy that has a studio at his house and we do our show and pipe it in. And, and uh, so it's, it's tough going right now, but we're able to sustain. And uh, we did have a piece of equipment go down. So we got to figure out how to pay for that. But you know, that's, <laughs> that's nothing new. So uh, anyway, glad to be here. And uh, Let's see who hadn't been on. Let's see, since you're from California, why don't you pass it on to Alicia? She's from California too. Oh, okay. Alicia. Yes, hi, thank you, Clyde. Yes, um, so yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm in uh, with KBBF and it's in Santa Rosa, California. And uh, very, I, I just caught a little bit of what Joseph was saying. Yeah, we are in a situation where we're still not on uh, uh, in Sonoma County, we're not yet in sheltering, back in sheltering place, I guess, uh, the order, but we probably will very soon. We have had uh, days when uh, the infection level, it's um, about 350 people or more, 380. One time we reached 400 in one day, more than 400 uh, infected people, you know, and um, and so we, we're... We think we're going to be really soon going back into to being in shelter. Um, 
And so, yeah, and one, I think last time I said that, uh, you know, uh, our, our community is about 24% Latinos, but yet we comprise about 74% of the infected uh, uh, COVID um, 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 cases. So at one point in, in June is when we hit 91% uh, of those infected were uh, Latinos. So we at least we're going down, but it's still very horrible. And a lot of it, it has to do because most of our farm workers are Latino, from Latino and indigenous uh, um, uh, towns in Mexico. And so it's expected that that's why that, and also, um, most of the, the Latinos, uh, many of them, I should say, they live in close quarters. So there's, uh, you know, in some cases, there's more than nine people in a house or, you know, three households or four households. Uh, some, some, some Latinos may have, let's say, own their house, but in, in reality, they rent, it, they rent each room to a family. So in order to pay the mortgage. So, you know, a lot of it is if one gets infected, everybody gets infected and there's no way to... To, um, to isolate yourself. Um, so uh, it's, yeah, it's been hard. KBBS been, KBBS been uh, just doing, you know, what we need to do and that's give out the information and education to the rest of our community. Thank you so much. Thanks, Alicia. <clears throat> Why don't we pass on to, did, do you want to pick did, one? Yeah, Devin, Devin, did you already go? Davine did oh, good. Yeah, yep. yeah, okay. Doug, Doug? Doug went. We have uh, David and Lewis and Cynthia. Oh, Lewis. Lewis, you're at it over in LA, right? Also in California? Um, yes. That... Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. We can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm in California, uh, the University of California, Riverside. I happen to be in Los Angeles right now. Um, the situation that the hospitals are at or near capacity. Um, and. Uh, um, that's the, and my mother, if Ursula were here, I could relate to her caring for her mother. I'm here caring for my mother, who is now in the emergency room at a, at a local hospital. I cannot visit her because of, of COVID. They're overloaded there and allowing no one in, which is reasonable. Um, but um, anyway, I'm, I'm concerned about uh, this issue that we are going to discuss and looking forward to it. Uh, the next who's who's not spoken. Let's go to David. Thank you, Lewis. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, David Klon. I'm uh, bringing it back to the middle of the country. I'm up in Minneapolis and uh, just kind of riding this out like everyone else. Um, you know, it was kind of weird early in the pandemic. Um, I didn't know anyone that had it. I had heard of a few people. I knew someone who knew someone, <clears throat> but like all of you, I've got relatives that either have either had it or have died from it now. And uh, it's, it's crazy to me that there are still people that resist mask wearing, something so ridiculously simple. Uh, anyway, I, um, I'm doing well and um, it's good to hear you all are too. Joseph, I saw your announcement of 40 year anniversary. Congratulations, that's awesome. And uh, that's all I have. Okay, and uh, how about Cynthia? Can you hear us, Cynthia? Sure can, how are you? I'm good, how are you doing in New York? Okay, okay. Do um, okay. you have anything with... you wanna share? Just that, like every place else, COVID is spiking. And, you know, yesterday, more there were about as many lives lost as in 9-11. And that's pretty shocking. You know, I'm, I'm just here to listen. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And I think that's about everyone. I see there's a phone number that says 142-374-16969. Are, are you connected to be able to talk? I 
Maybe, maybe not. Okay. Hi, yes, this is this is vertical uh, from the detour, and I'm just I'm just listening. Thank you. I think the phone okay. works better. For this is the vertical. Great. Always glad glad to have you, vertical. Thanks for joining us. And I think that's everybody. Did I miss anyone? Of course, we're going to introduce Russell. our guest. Hello, everybody. Oh, Sorry. Ursula, she's back. Sorry, You're I just missed in everybody. Time. You're just in time to say yeah. hi. Yeah, hi. I, sorry, <laughs> I had to take care of stuff. Great. There's new people here. It's great to yeah, see you Yeah, we got guys. some new faces. That's so nice. Is this Michael White from Wisconsin? Yes. Oh, Wisconsin. You guys are bad, bad people. <laughs> I've heard that. <laughs> Excess does not like you. <laughs> uh, do you want to give a update on how you're doing, Ursula, before we? Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything to report. Um, not really. You know, things are the same here in Iowa. One of we, one of our um, our radio hosts' mother died last night. So, you know, it's coming pretty close. She was, she was in a nursing home, you know, and, and they, and they had, they had, they had, what do they call it? They had a, a breakout and she was the first to die. She, she died in a week. It was really fast. Wow. So, you know, it feels pretty close to home right now. It's not abstract. And, you know, and she was like an avid community radio listener. So hated, hated to lose her. <laughs> Yeah, so it's uh, you know, I got the text last night in the middle of the night that she had passed. So it feels pretty close to home right now, you know. Lewis was just mentioning that his mother, who he's been caring for at home, has moved to the hospital. And yeah, he was thinking. Yeah. Of well, you I'm, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Is is does she have the virus, Lewis? No, no, she, okay. she has some some abdominal mass that they're about okay. to for surgery. But everyone around there does. So it's, you're worried, yeah? Oh, yeah. I mean, they're yeah. they're uh, at they're beyond capacity at that particular hospital, and yeah. uh, from COVID patients. And I, when I went there, it was just obvious that I would never get in to see her. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand. Yeah. yeah, my father was in the hospital. And we couldn't see him either. It was, yeah, well, I'm really sorry. It's it's scary. It just feels all pretty close to home by now. Yeah. Well, on that note, um, we'll talk on um, what we can do. Um, we have Michael White with us today. And oh, before I introduce him, I just want to mention um, a, a little aside. Uh, we have the vacuum man here today and he's cleaning our carpets. So there might be some noise on my end. So I apologize in advance. And I have my dog in here and she does not like this noise and she might make noise because of the other noise. And I gave her a treat that she's working on and so far it's working. But well, that's what the mute button is for, Stephanie. Well, I know, I, I, will, do that. <laughs> I will do that. But if, I, if something happens, I will mute it, but that's what that is anyway. <laughs> Um, so I want to introduce Michael White. He's the producer of Baroque and Beyond, who I'm sure a few of you are familiar with. He's also a physician, and um, he sent me uh, just some background on him today, and I thought it was really lovely, so I just want to share it with you guys. Um, he is the chair of the Alliance Party of Wisconsin, which is interesting. I've never heard of the Alliance Party. That sounds like it could be another group discussion. Um, former co-chair of Wisconsin Green Party, and he has a little bit of a story there. He left the Green Party because uh, he was encouraged to run for governor as a Green Party person, uh, but then when he ran, no one supported him, so <laughs> frustrating. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, so Sounds familiar. <laughs> um, he's on the board of directors for La Crosse County Medical Society, and about to assume the role of president, as well as the board, as a board member for Wisconsin Medical Society. And when he doesn't have anything else to do, he says he's taking a math class at UW La Crosse, keeping bees, raising chickens, and dabbles in art. And he sent me a little picture, which I want to share with you guys. Oh wait, I can't do that yet. 
Got to do the proper steps here. Here we go. This is a picture that he painted of mint ice cream. Oh, nice. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Very nice. Oh. Yes, I can taste it. <laughs> right? It looks so nice and just where I want to be right now. Mm. So that's that. And um, I like that, Michael. Yeah, he's got that leaf. Thank too. you. That sprout leaf. <laughs> So without any further ado, I'll, I'll let uh, Michael White add anything he would like to add and we'll, we'll start talking about approaches for sharing um, information on vaccines. So on to you. A couple, couple of quick things. First, if I'm a little off the wall or you decide you really aren't glad you invited me, blame David because it's David's fault that I got into radio. Um, I, I knew this David. was going to come up. I just knew this was going to come up. <laughs> So, so, All right, so about, uh, about 10 years ago, David and Todd Fisher were doing a presentation in our local Linux group about doing standing up WDRT radio in Viroco with open source free software. And an unsolicited plug for Dave, if you have equipment and software issues, he's the go-to guy because he stood up uh, WDRT um, and helps a lot of radio stations. But I said, gee, that's different than when I was a radio, you know, DJ in college. And I thought, I thought Todd was going to rip my arm off. You got to do a radio show for us. Well, it took him two years. And I finally said, okay, I'll do one. Um, and a month later, they said, well, we're not, we're not going to run your show because we found somebody local to do it, but you still have to produce it. <laughs> what? Wow, You're not that's gonna like broadcast it, but I have to produce it. Well, I had been traded to KPVL in Postville. And that led to being introduced to Ursula and the people at KHOI. And that led eventually to being on the Pacifica Radio Network. And I'm, I'm proud to say um, I've done it without a break for eight years. And I do it in a small homemade studio at home. And I'm strictly an amateur. And every once in a while, the audio quality is not the best. And I screw things up. So love to hear from anybody if there's questions, requests, criticisms, whatever. So I'm fond of saying I couldn't hold a job. Um, the, I was originally in an MD PhD program. The Navy paid for med school, told me you're not allowed to do the PhD. I did my MD, uh, got yanked out of my residency, went to sea with the Navy. I did a year at ship. I did a year of occupation at sea. I did a year of occupational medicine. Um, then I went to flight surgeon school. Uh, I spent, uh, a, after that, I spent two years at a research facility spinning people to jelly in the human centrifuge, uh, doing cold water studies, and literally, I sat on a bomb and pulled the trigger. Uh, we had ejection seat tower studies, and we don't use rockets on the tower because the rockets don't turn off at the top of the tower. It's kind of tacky to burn people's legs off. So we literally would sit on a bomb and pull the trigger and the explosive charge would blow us up the tower. I finished with the Navy, went back to grad school. Two years later, I got thrown out of grad school, um, switched to the Air Force and the Air Force sent me to three foreign countries in a row, West Texas, Japan, and Korea. From there, I got to go to Harvard to do my dermatology training. From there, I got sent to a third world country appended to the south of the United States known as Mississippi. Um, after that, I came north to uh, Wright-Patterson where I finished my uh, career, um, joined the faculty at Wright State University, taught dermatology for six years, then came up and joined Mayo. And at the end of the month, I'm retiring from my practice with Mayo Clinic. Um, I do volunteer work with the health department um, because as a hospital commander in Korea and part of a war planning group, we used to be involved in planning for biological warfare and a variety of other mass disasters. Um, so I have a little more sympathy and empathy for public health issues than most people. And I was dumb enough to volunteer. I became interested and aware of uh, the coronavirus in early January. I have two close friends that are physicians in China, each of which is a director of a regional hospital. And they were impacted as early as about the 12th of January, having to send physicians from their provinces into Hubei province, Wuhan, to provide staffing. So I was getting 
I was very carefully looking on the internet at the Johns Hopkins uh, site and various other sites to follow the numbers. Um, at the present time, I'm on two working groups. One is on testing, COVID testing, because we're not doing the good job that I would like to see us do. And the other working group I'm on, and I have a meeting tomorrow on that one, is on vaccination. And Stephanie reached out to me, said, hey, your name was volunteered as somebody who could come talk to us. So I'm not an infectious disease expert. I have a superficial approach to medicine. I'm a dermatologist, um, but I have a very broad ranging scientific and medical background. And uh, I care a lot about public health issues. Um, and as a dermatologist, I've actually diagnosed several COVID patients um, and am well aware of our, our local circumstances. Um, so my question at this point, I'm gonna turn around and ask you guys a question. What can I do to help you? Do you want me to just tell you more about the vaccination stuff that I know, or uh, do you have specific questions, or what would be the most helpful? Davine? Davine? Well, they, I think Fauci was saying he, he anticipated 18 months uh, a few months back, uh, but here we are now with vaccines becoming available. And I'm concerned that there's not enough testing that's been done uh, to uh, see if things are going to go as well as they could go. Uh, what, what's, so your, what's your opinion on so it coming so quickly? Reformulating the question, it's coming so quickly, is it safe? And yes. why have we been able to do it so quickly when we haven't done that in the past? Yes. Have they cut corners? You bet your sweet pippy, they cut corners. Uh, one of the things that normally happens with a vaccine is they do phase one studies, then phase two studies, and then phase three studies. We had phase two and phase three studies going simultaneously for a given vaccine so that things were uh, done much more rapidly than would otherwise be the case. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? And the answer is both. Uh, I have reservations about the speed, just like everybody else does. But I want to tell you something about vaccine developments. If this gets deployed this month, next month into March, it will be the first time in history that a vaccine has been developed for a new disease where the vaccine was actually deployed before the epidemic was already over. In all of the other circumstances that we've had, well, the flu vaccines are a little bit different, but in all the other vaccines that we've had, like the Ebola vaccine, for example, the epidemic was over before they had one available to use. So the, epi the vaccines in general have prevented recurrences of diseases. This is a little different than measles and mumps and those things that have been going on endemic, that means constant low rate forever, where we brought the death rate down. But when you had a new disease that appeared, Zika virus, Lassa fever, Marburg virus, the other ones you don't know about, um, the epidemic came, it passed through, it killed a lot of people and vaccines came later. So what's extraordinary about what's going on now is this is the first time in history where a vaccine is being deployed when the disease is still actively spreading and hasn't read its peak. This is the first time we will have the opportunity to know, does it make a difference? Can we abort an expanding vaccine with the implementation of this vaccine? Second question, is it safe? I'm gonna be one of the first ones in line. Now, part of that is I'm retired military and I'm stupid, <laughs> but the, there's another way to think of this vaccine is not a live virus vaccine. So there's a lot of vaccines out there which are an inactivated version of the virus or a virus that causes minimal to no disease. That's not what this is. This vaccine is a piece of, a, of RNA actually that is taken in by specialized cells to turn on a response to a particular protein. The best example that we have of a vaccine like this is the tetanus shot. Everybody on this call has had a tetanus shot. And we're not afraid to get it except we're afraid of a sore arm because the tetanus shot 
can't give you a virus. It's just a protein that stimulates your immune system about the protein. What bothers me about that is, okay, I got to get a tetanus shot every year or every 10 years because I managed to hurt myself at least once every 10 years and I need a booster. Um, does that mean that this vaccine won't be durable? And I would say that would be my guess, but we don't know, we don't have data. What I can tell you about the two that are coming, the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine, both of them are two shots. There is good news about protection after the first shot, but we don't think it's enough. And so people are gonna get two shots. What each of you is probably gonna be offered is the Moderna vaccine and not the Pfizer vaccine. And the reason is twofold. One, the Pfizer vaccine requires temperatures that are extremely cold. They're called ultra cold, 80 degrees centigrade below zero. In La Crosse County, where I live, there's only four ultra cold refrigerators, one at the university, one at the health department, one at the Mayo facility, and one at Gunnarsson Health. Uh, there are many counties across the country that there's not an ultra cold freezer within 100, 200 miles. Um, there are also some logistics about how you have to get it out. That one comes in vials of 10 shots. Once you thaw the vial, you got to give all 10 shots within five hours. So the logistics, even here, so for example, I'm a medical advisor to the La Crosse County Medical Reserve Corps, and we're asking, how are we going to do the Ho-Chunk Nation? How are we going to get the vaccine up and do appointments to make it available and know that our patients are gonna show, how are we gonna do the migrant workers with Ashley Furniture, most of whom are Hispanic, many of which may not be legal. Um, how are we gonna solve all those kinds of problems? Uh, the challenge locally is the hospitals, Mayo and Gunners have said, okay, we'll take care of our people and our patients. Everybody else is your problem, health department. And how much resources do you think the health department has? Um, we've come, one of our people has come up with some really innovative things. We're working with our EMS and fire. They're the first ones that the health department is going to vaccinate them and their families. And they in turn are going to be trained to be our deploying team for vaccinating out in the community um, that we're going to deliver vaccination to the various places as opposed to trying to get people to come to the hospital. The quantities of vaccine that are being shipped to Wisconsin, we don't know yet. We're going to find out next week. Um, there are supply limitations because the uh, Trump administration declined to put in a second larger order for enough vaccine um, when they had that opportunity back in July. Um, and the good news is the Moderna vaccine, because it is stored at a lower temperature, is going to be deployed directly to vaccination sites, including Walgreens, CVS, other pharmacy chains. So they're not gonna have to go necessarily through the health department or for one of the choke points like one of the major hospitals. Also the um, uh, Moderna vaccine after it has been um, warmed up can be kept at room temperature for a longer period of time. So you've got a longer window to be able to vaccinate people. Both vaccines are two shots. One is three weeks later, one is four weeks later. I just saw a report this morning that there's as much as an 85% protection rate after the first shot. The bad news I have for people is that uh, the second shot's gonna hurt. Not so much the first shot, but with the second shot, there are well-documented reports of people getting temperatures to 102, headache, severe muscle aches and pains, you feel like you got the flu and people are gonna claim they got the flu. No, those symptoms are not the flu. Those symptoms are your immune system responding appropriately to the antigen, the thing that triggers a reaction. So that it actually um, means that you're having a good response to the vaccine. Um, but I, I tell people to expect that because what happens is if we don't warn them in advance, then they think um, something is bad is happening. Um, uh, can I help frame the took shortcuts message for our community radio audiences? Um, 
what that means is normally that there is an orderly sequence and one doesn't start until uh, the other one is done. And usually it doesn't start until all the data from the first one has been analyzed. So sometimes there's a six month delay between two uh, studies. Also, usually with these studies, it takes a long time to find enough volunteers uh, to get shots. When the two drug companies went out, hey, we need volunteers, they were swamped with volunteers across the country. Um, so I don't think that they took any shortcuts in terms of monitoring for safety. I'm a little bit concerned that they deliberately used a somewhat liberal case definition for measuring when somebody was showing up uh, with, with COVID. And that's because we know there are limitations in the antibody tests and anytime there's a new disease, for example, we didn't know for a month or two that GI symptoms are a significant part of uh, the syndrome in some people that they, they don't have a cough, they don't have pneumonia, they have a terrible GI illness, but by the way, they have COVID. Um, all right, so I'll Can pause I, um, and see if that helps. Can I ask a question helps. related to that? Please. Um, to, related to the speed of the um, development of the vaccine, I was listening to Dr. Derry on WHIV, who is an epidemiologist, and he was saying that one of the reasons that we have been able to develop it the vaccine faster is because we have research from previous coronaviruses that they could build on. Um, right. Does that, does that speak to you? It does. I mean, the, the, the cold viruses, the ones we get every year are mostly, not exclusively, mostly coronaviruses. The bad news is that we don't typically retain a lot of immunity to that. And one, two or three years later, after you get one coronavirus, you can get reinfected with the same virus. Some of that is because this group of viruses mutate a lot more frequently than DNA viruses. And it's kind of technical why I could go into that if, if people wanted. But he's right, we have research that was underway. In fact, it turns out that Moderna, because of the way they developed the research, because of previous work done in similar viruses, they actually had a prototype vaccine within weeks and shipped um, a prototype vaccine to the FDA for phase one trials at the end of February. That's stunning. That's, that's much faster than we've ever seen before. This is the result of AIDS. As a result of the HIV infection, a whole bunch of research tools were developed to evaluate that RNA virus and all of the other things that go with it. Uh, that were not there before. If this, if this virus had hit in 1970, we'd have been screwed uh, because we would have had no, no tools to even begin to evaluate it. Um, and somebody pointed out the Oxford group had already been working coronavirus transmission in monkeys. I'd read that. I haven't been able to follow up on it. Um, temperature reading. Um, the question is, we use a temperature reading check if staff should stay home. If we react to the second shot with the high temperature, staff may stay home. Uh, yeah, I would, you know, I, I would expect people to be out of commission for 24, maybe 36 hours. No more than that from the second shot. And by the way, it's only going to be about 25% of people. But if it's you, it's 100%. And if we don't warn people that it's likely to happen, there'll be all kinds of people posting, this is terrible. They're not telling us about the risk, et cetera. So I like, I like to give people the bad news up front. I, Michael, uh, what component of the vaccine requires such cold temperature storage? I hate it when people ask really intelligent questions that I don't know the answer to. <laughs> I don't know. And I, I guess Moderna must have different components uh, that don't need to be so cold, I suppose. Well, you know, the ba basically, um, the, when you heat something up, the faster you heat it up, the more it falls apart. That's why you boil things. That temperature causes proteins to denature, proteins to, you know, things to come apart. My guess is the molecule has to be a certain shape 
and it begins to decay from that shape at room temperature, it can unfold and do other things. So if you kept it at room temperature, say beyond a day, it wouldn't be in the right three-dimensional shape for the body to recognize. If you look at, at the video, things worth antibody recognition work in a lock and key. So an antibody that recognizes the left elbow won't recognize the right elbow. They're very shape dependent. And the thing that is gonna trigger the antibody reaction has to have a particular shape. And that's kind of the stuff that changes with temperature. It denatures proteins, it causes molecules to break apart and other things. That's a guess on my part. What, uh, why is it um, the antigens, the antigen test just didn't take off? I haven't seen a whole lot about it, but um, nice to know if you've had it, but there hasn't been a lot of distribution of the antigen test. Wisconsin is doing something really interesting that, that initially got a lot of criticism, and I'm going to explain a little bit about the virus and how the antigen test works. So... Um, the virus will express an antigen. Well, what the hell is an antigen? An antigen is a protein or a sugar or a molecule that the body will recognize, that an antibody system will recognize. Um, antigens sometimes have more than one part. So if my left arm is an antigen, my fingers are one epitope, my wrist is another epitope, my elbow is another epitope, and different antibodies that I might produce might react to different parts. That's why sometimes antibody uh, or vaccines don't always work. Eugene gets a vaccine and he only reacts to the left ear and James reacts to the nose and David reacts to the butt and only reacting to the butt inactivates the virus. So that's why sometimes vaccines aren't that helpful. Um, so um, an antigen is produced when the vaccine is taken up by specialized cells, garbage can cells that process it, break it into parts and present the antigen to another cell, the T cell, the cells that the AIDS virus kills. The T cells are the cells that run the immune system and they in turn stimulate specialized antibody producing cells called B cells. So it's kind of complicated but the antigen is one which has been designed to produce a particular reaction. Um, and uh, I think I lost my train of thought. Am I, have I answered the question? Your train of thought is still boarding at the station. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it gets complicated. No, I was just wondering, um, you know, so if you got an antigen test and you found that you've already had Oh, the, yeah, I know where it was. Yeah. I don't know okay, why we so, have so, antigen testing. I don't know. Here's why, because I got diverted. Here's why. The, the antigen, uh, so uh, if we do a swab of your nose or the spit test, there's one of those, uh, you only get a little bit of a sample. So presumably there is some antigen in there and you have to multiply it in some way to make it detectable. And so what they do is they have certain antigen tests that are very, very, very sensitive and they will detect extremely small amounts of antigen. Um, and those have been shown to be effective only in periods of high volume of the virus in the nose or in the pharynx or whatever, whatever we're swabbing. Um, and that's only for a limited period of time. So if, if, let's look at the screen. If this is how much time you've got the virus total, the antigen test is only gonna be positive most of the time reliably in that small fraction. So, you know, one tenth of the total time that you're infected, the antigen is actually gonna be present in a high enough amount in your nose or pharynx, the back of the mouth to be detected. The PCR tests, you've heard that phrase, polymerase chain reaction, that is looking for actual fragments of the virus that are then multiplied. They put in polymerase chain um, uh, enzymes and they multiply the fragments of the virus. If you do more than 28 or 30 cycles of amplification, 
you get really bogus numbers where you start to have lots, lots of false positives. What Wisconsin is doing is brilliant, is they said, okay, we know that the antigen test is not reliable, it misses a lot. Okay, we don't care. We're gonna test everybody in sight at the university and a positive is a positive is a positive and only the ones that don't come up positive at the antigen test will then get the PCR test or the blood test. So we're gonna go for something that is not as sensitive as we want, but it's cheap. It's $5 or 50, I think it's $5 a test. We're gonna do a lot of them. And then we're gonna do focused tests on, the, on the, the, the people that need it. I tried to get the local health departments to take the same route. And this is one of the things that's hurt our response. That, no, these are the rules. We gotta follow the rules. We gotta stay inside the box. We, <laughs> we're worried we're gonna get sued. Uh, bad people might come and knock on our door if we do anything other than do it by the rules. Um, but the university is being very daring and they're doing a very broad testing and that's going to allow us. Now, why aren't more um, people doing the same thing? Because when they try to, they often get stepped on uh, because, again, this is dysfunction at a higher level of government. There's a turf war going on about you got to do it this way because Health and Human Services and DeFure says this is how we have to do it as opposed to thinking a little bit independently. I'm hoping that'll all change in January. Not that I have any political opinions. <laughs> Michael, do you know what the uh, magic medicine was that was given to Donald Trump? Uh, not entirely. We know he was given the Regeneron uh, cocktail and there and was another that? antibody cocktail. What, uh, is it? what is Regeneron? Uh, Regeneron is remdesivir, which is an antiviral medicine developed for another illness. And oh, by the way, the, the studies that have come out since then carefully, and said, yeah, probably doesn't help. Doesn't help much at all. Um, there was also a, uh, I think he got uh, convalescent plasma. So we got blood collected from other people that had antibodies um, and those would help. And then there are a couple of monoclonal antibodies that have been developed. And I really don't know what's in that. That hasn't been shared in a, in a way that I've seen. What about hydroxychloroquine? What have people heard about that? Because that's going to come up. Doesn't work. Yeah, it's a myth. Trump well, maybe. A shot of steroids too, which I think helped him. Yep, yep. Steroids may also have helped. So steroids have definitely been shown to help in people that are in certain stages of the disease. They may help progress, prevent progression to go to the ICU, but it looks like they don't lower mortality. I'm gonna tell you I'm on both sides of hydroxychloroquine. There are people out there, there's a whole bunch of people out there. Ron Johnson has been running some hearings where he's been pulling people who said, look, look, this is a marvelous cure. It prevents people from getting sick. And it, you know, you, you get everybody on hydroxychloroquine plus zinc, plus vitamin D, plus ivermectin, which is an antiparasite, and they're not gonna need hospitalization. And they got lots of patients that they can point to that did all of that, that didn't get hospitalized. But those studies are not well controlled when they do controlled studies where they got people in the hospital that are documented, they're hospital ill, some of them got it, some of them didn't, there's either minimal effect or no effect. So that suggests, as David and other people said, that it doesn't work. Well, excuse me, you didn't test the people that are at home that are pre-hospital that you put on the medicine versus pre-hospital that you don't put on the medicine. And it may prevent progression enough to wind up being hospitalized. And that's really a possibility. And oh, by the way, hydroxychloroquine or Plaquenil is used very broadly as an immune modifier for lupus, for Sjogren's disease, for cutaneous lupus, for a lot of things. And I'm on it for a form of arthritis. Um, it is an immune modifier that is mostly very safe. So the other docs are saying, wait a minute, you're being you're being ridiculous in suppressing this because it is an almost zero risk medicine and we're not doing any harm and it may be helpful in some subgroups. So why not use it? And that's a, 
plausible question that hasn't been well answered. And that's the problem is that there's a lot of heat on every side of these things. There's a lot of emotion. Um, I know some doctors that are reading things on Facebook and YouTube and other places who are not listening to some of the well done studies. And this whole thing has become politicized and that's unfortunate. We don't need that. I'll get off my soapbox. Hi, this is vertical. I have a question. Um, so over here in East Tennessee, we, you know, we, we have some skepticism. Um, I'm hearing people say that uh, they are concerned that it was rushed um, and they're wanting to wait to just like, you know, yesterday or the day before we heard for the first time about that severe allergic reaction. Those medical staff stop, in the UK. Stop, 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 stop. It's not an allergic reaction. Now, okay, well, I'm sorry. Let, let me finish few, my there question. There are a few. Yeah, go well, ahead. Let me, let me finish my question real quick. And you can, you're welcome to, uh, to change. Yeah, you, thank you for, for clarifying that. I, I, I'm just sharing this third hand. So, so if I misstate anything, please correct me. But the long, long story short, I'm just wondering um, what your thoughts are on those people that would prefer to wait. Uh, they, they, they feel like there are some kinks that are possibly needing to be worked out. Uh, the, um, the percentage that, like, you know, might be a little higher than stated. You know, just, they're, they're kind of skeptical in various ways. Um, and so what, what are your thoughts on that? And, and again, thank you for correcting anything that I may have misspoke about. Yeah, I, I just, when you said a oh, severe allergic, I, I need to jump on that. There have a few people that seem to have a very strong reaction, possibly allergic with the shots. Uh, I'm gonna be honest. I think there are a few cases that are having a real allergy, but I gotta tell you that there are some people that are, you know, they have a, when they come in to see me, they got a list of allergies with 20 drugs on their medicine. There are some people whose immune system react inappropriately under almost every circumstance. That doesn't apply to the average person. The reaction that's gonna be common is a side effect and not an allergic reaction. And the reason I jumped on it is people throw the word allergy around a lot and it's appropriate to understand the difference. Now, to the meat of your question, well, what about people that wanna wait? What's the harm or risk in waiting? And you know, that is a really good question. Uh, Jill Stein, the former Green Party candidate is a friend of mine um, and I'll come back to the arrhythmia question, James, because um, because that's also a good one. Um, Jill Stein's a friend of mine, and she was quoted as being anti-vaccine during the presidential election, and that's absolutely not the case. She's not an anti-vaxxer, but she is concerned about the heavy-handedness with which some of the vaccine programs have been implemented, and she was trying to express support for parents and school systems and other people that want to exert more local control. And that's, that's the core of this matter. In Taiwan, New York City has uh, an eight to nine million people and they've had more than a quarter of a million cases so far. And Taiwan has 24 million and they've had less than, um, less than 2000 cases so far. What's the difference? The difference is number one, they do have more control, people coming on to and leaving the island. But number two, everybody masked up early. There was a very high degree of consensus about social distancing. And we don't have that degree of communal sense of responsibility. Instead, as a society, I demand my right to be stupid. I demand my right to control my kids uh, exposure to vaccines or whatever. And that, that's part of our culture. I'm not running it down, but that's the core of the problem is that we're not in a position where we can force anything. Uh, there's a lot of political discussions about are we doing more damage to the economy than we are saving lives and how much damage is it worth uh, to destroy the economy to save one old person, let the old people die. I mean, people, people have said that. I decline to be one of the old people that dies. Um, I think we could have done a much better job of implementing social distancing and protecting each other without as much damage to the equation and to the economy. But the question is, what about the vaccine? 
So coming back to it, what are you going to tell people? One of the PAs that I work with said, I'm not getting the vaccine. And our organization said, that's your prerogative, but you have to sign the education system statement that says you understand what's involved. Um, and I, I, res I disagree with, but I respect people that don't want to get it for any of a variety of reasons. Um, coming out of the military and having been involved in a number of things, I trust things maybe. I've, I'm one of the few people you're gonna met who's had all of his anthrax vaccines because we had evidence of anthrax being as a, used as a biological warfare weapon in, in Korea and anybody sent over there needed to have the anthrax shots and I was the first one in Ohio to get it. Um, but I have more allegiance to and trust in the mechanism than a lot of people. So I hope that answers the question um, in a more helpful way. Michael, I've, I've heard that a large percentage of medical people don't want to get the vaccine. Why is that? Uh, I'm going to pick on the words large percentage. There is a percentage. Uh, I don't know how large it is. I think it varies a lot. So in Montana, where there's a friend of mine who's an anesthesiologist, she says nobody out there wants to get it. They also don't have very many COVID cases. Um, my daughter is a nurse who's we're taking care of COVID patients in Madison and they're over flipping whelmed. And she says, I'll get the first one I can get and everybody around me will too. Um, because they're watching people. She, she saw a 21 year old come in and come in minimally ill and wind up in the ICU after 12 hours. That's the thing I hand back to people. So we'll go back to the hydroxychloroquine and Zithromax. Yeah, there are certain combinations that do raise some risk. So here's the, here's the risk of problems with that drug combination unrecognized in some people. Here's the risk of dying from COVID. You know, the proportionate risk ratio is very different. And the problem is we don't know and any given patient, there's people that have multiple risk factors who you think should, should do poorly and they do great. And there's other people who you have no idea why and they're dying. Yeah, it's weird. It's very confusing. So I hope I'm helping. Um, I'm happy to be a resource in any way uh, for anybody. Um, well, I've Michael, I, on, go ahead. You know, we're, we're, um, we're, we're radio stations, so, you know, partly we have journalistic responsibilities to report on our communities. And uh, I know that, uh, you know, there's some confusion and, and just kind of um, concern about how to, uh, how to report on this responsibly. I, I think, you know, most stations I've talked to, and I know at Pacifica, People feel we can't ignore this because this is going to be the story of 2021. But there's a lot of trepidation about being able to, as not, you know, as not, as non-medical people, to know what to report, you know, what what to look for to report responsibly. And I'm just wondering if, like, from your perspective, what markers you think can be looked at, you know, by the state by stations, like. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking like, um, you know, what you said about knowing about how many freezers there are in, in your community or, or, you know, what, what are the, what are the kind of external signs of, of how this is going to go down? What, what can stations watch for? So, um, I'll see if I can simplify it. Uh, coming forward, the first implementation is going to be the Pfizer vaccine. It's going to be healthcare personnel. Uh, high risk people, nursing homes, those kinds of situations, and uh, first responders, key and essential workers, and there's not enough vaccine to get all of them. So it is unlikely that any ordinary citizens will get any of the, Pfizer, the first delivery of the Pfizer vaccine. Um, and because of the cold storage limitations, that's only gonna be a key distribution points and it's going to be by appointment only the yes david um who gets to define key and essential worker or key and essential people is that state by state community by community do you know how yes. that's being it's it's being so far it's being top down driven there are conference calls i get on every week 
um, the Wisconsin Department of Health, uh, uh, Health Services is having uh, stuff posted and guidance is going to come to us from Wisconsin. I don't know what's going on in, in Minnesota and other places. Right, so every, every state's, state's going to be, be different. Yeah, okay. So that's, a, so that's a good question that a radio station can, can mm -hmm. look You know, that's a, a key point of information that you could look for in your areas. Who is, who's making those determinations and on what right. basis? That's right. a good one. And then, and then the other one is I know that certain pharmacy chains are going to be authorized to uh, get the Moderna vaccine because that's going to be distributed directly through people ad administering it to you in a pharmacy. Locally, I'm reaching out to dentists and veterinarians to see if other if we can increase the number of providers that could administer vaccines just to make it more widely available. Um, and we can, within the guidelines from the state of Wisconsin, we can do that um, because we're gonna have EMTs that are part of the fire departments that'll be doing it in a deployed fashion. So the questions are says, who's gonna be authorized? What kind of training do they have to get? Do they get certified by the state? In Wisconsin, we do. There's a, in fact, the physicians have to get certified by the state. Um, uh, is it going to, what about, can you sue? That's another one. Are you going to be able to sue if you have a reaction? And am I going to be at risk if I administer a vaccine? Are you going to be sued? Supposedly the people administering it are going to be protected. It is my expectation. This is opinion, not knowledge. It is my expectation that the government in some way is going to assume liability for any vaccine reactions, and they will protect the uh, vaccine manufacturers from any lawsuits. Um, and they're gonna have to do that in order to be able to deploy it. Um, do I expect that we're gonna have all kinds of bizarre reactions like we've had with other ones? No, I actually don't. I think it's gonna be more like the tetanus, but that's an opinion because of the nature of the vaccine and the answers I don't have any certainty whatsoever. Does that help? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, th th that's really helpful. Um, it, it is really, yeah. I mean, it, it, you really, we really need to start breaking down how, how, to, how to understand what's happening locally, right? How, right. how this is really playing out. And it's, it's um, a little bit overwhelming to figure you know out what questions to ask. Ursula and Stephanie, what we may do is the three of us, maybe with David, um, you know, form a small group for just bouncing questions around and then having a mechanism to reach out and, and ask people. Because yeah, you, you I, really, yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not an epidemiologist. It'd be really nice I, if I could get Fauci to come on the call, that would be great. <laughs> um, but, but if, but you know, you've got somebody equivalent to him in each case where you are at a local university, you've got somebody, and I would recommend reaching out to one of them. There's yeah, some we could great probably talk that, Mark Allen into being involved too. I think it would be really great to come up with some sort of cheat sheet to, you know, make available to stations in the network about how to start unpacking this locally. It would. It would, yep, yeah, somebody would be just, really... David, sent the same thing. He's good at reading minds. So could, would it be possible to have um, learned people like yourself and Dr. Dreary give, uh, record maybe a um, five or 10 minute informational uh, piece that we could play uh, that cuts through the noise and just gives people important facts. Would that I be think, possible? I think, that's, I think that that's possible. I think it's a marvelous idea. I think that the responsibility that I have with Stephanie and Ursula uh, and maybe Dave, just because I know Dave, is to try and formulate those. And then instead of me giving them, I'm happy to do that. Don't misunderstand me. You want me, I'll do it for you. You're going to be better off having Dr. Schmo from your local university that everybody knows, he'll be vastly more credible than some old white guy up in Wisconsin. I disagree. Okay. No, oh, okay. I, no, I, I, I don't think that's... I well, think, I, think, I think we can do a combination. I mean, it's gonna be up to each yeah. station, each individual station. Um, yeah. 
but yeah um, well i mean I, i'm also just thinking from i mean you know we 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 get our local you know our cl the local hospital and clinic they'll come on the radio when we ask them to but we don't always know you know they're, they're going to give us their pr spiel we, we right need, we need to know what to ask them obviously they're going to tell us as little as they can because they're overwhelmed with responsibility well, they, so, they also don't want to get in trouble right. with their university etc and the blessing that i have is i don't give a shit um when when i was running i was the green party candidate for governor and i we were at a a debate among all the marty minor panel uh party members and one of the people said what do you think would you consider decriminalizing marijuana and the three guys before me gave long-winded answers and it got to me i said yes next question um <laughs> <laughs> and you're telling us you know, it supports you <laughs> um yeah right what the, 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 the green the, the, i'm gonna speak ill of the green party right now a lot of well-meaning people with no follow-through yeah i hear you i hear that okay so uh, you know i i agree with many not all but many of the positions of the green party i'm, I'm a progressive sort of, i'm an old white guy i'm retired military i own guns but i support decriminalization of marijuana I support equal rights and opportunity for everybody. Uh, I mean, I was good enough for the Green Party. So I'm a little different hmm. than most candidates out there. So Davine, I'll be happy to help you in any way. Well, and honestly, I think this group is small enough. I don't think we need to break this into anything smaller. If people have ideas, no, that's this, fine too. share them now. Well, I'll just, I'll send them all through Stephanie and, and, uh, you know, you've got my, if you were on the, looked at the email, my email is there and feel free to email me directly. The two days I am very slow to respond are Tuesdays and Wednesdays for the rest of the month because those are the two days I still have patients and they're trying to get all my patients in to see me in the last three weeks that I'm working. Uh, so they turn out to be horrendously long days. Well, in our case, we have a, had a former uh, nonprofit hospital that was brought out by HCA. And there's just not a lot of confidence in the past 18 months or two years that we're getting uh, honest um, answers uh, about all kinds of things. So someone with uh, some um, uh, cojones from uh, Mayo would be uh, help people to have a little confidence. The only, the only caveat that I have is I'm retiring from Mayo and I, this is where I have to be careful. I'm not empowered by Mayo to speak for Mayo. You can say that I, you know, I worked at Mayo for X number 10, but I'm not speaking for Mayo. Um, yeah, they're Michael, very picky I'm curious, about that. Michael, the, the hospital up in Rochester, do they have COVID? patients out there in the hospital? Uh, many. Many. I think they have like 100 right now. They may have more than that. And we're having uh, a lot of staff members get sick. One of my partners got sick. Um, um, yeah, it's, it's a little scary because people are uh, following. So I got a general guidance for the stations. Uh, people are doing a good job about following all the rules and people are still getting sick. Number one, this is primarily an aerosol spread virus. What that means, not to just stop cleaning surfaces, but obsessive cleaning of surfaces in the station is not going to protect you. My, if I'm sick, my wearing a mask is some of the best protection you can have, but even that's not perfect. It may, let's say it, it gets 70% of my infectiousness. That means 30% still gets through. If I'm sick and not wearing a mask and you're wearing a mask, it's only gonna give you 20, 25% of protection. That's still better than nothing. But the combination of a mask on both of us, what is really scary is that it depends a lot on airflow. There was a study I just read this morning out of Korea where they, they tried to understand how a young person some 30 feet 
from another person got infected with the same virus. And what they were able to do is model the room and show there was a direct airflow from the right-hand corner of the room to the back left-hand corner because of the way the, the air ventilation system worked. And the, the virus particles stayed airborne long enough to go from point B to point A. So six feet is not reliable. It's better than three feet, but it's not reliable. There's no single distance that you can stand that is going to be, unless it's 100 yards, that's going to be reliably protective. Um, so masks are the most important things. Masks are not perfect. They don't provide perfect protection. Um, uh, mask that fits well um, enough that it, it sometimes modifies voice is better than one that's loose. When the mask is down over the nose, it's like not wearing a mask. Michael, could I ask a few questions about the testing, the, the SARS test? Sure. I've had about four tests done in the past two months, and each um, each write up, the, you know, the results given to me are worded very differently, um, as well as yep. the the technique. Uh, one one was the back of the throat swab, one one was deep into the nose, one was more shallow into the nose. Um, Anyway, and one result came back in six hours, and the others came back in three days. Um, the one that came back in six hours was called, was using the Simplexa assay, and it says Dias Diaserin Molecular LLC on the Liaison MDX platform. Very technical, but does that mean anything to you? Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't. I would say send me that and I'll look it up. Um, but the, it's not necessary to do the brain biopsy swabs anymore. Uh -huh. um, those are the ones that went to the back to the back of the throat because at that time we thought that was only the, the only place that the virus would show up. It is one of the most sensitive places to biopsy, has a higher yield, but it's really painful for some people. Um, and the front third of the nose uh, there's a decreased yield slightly, but it's good enough. Okay. Uh, why some of them take longer, a PCR test is actually trying to grow virus through multiplications and it intrinsically takes longer. An antigen test can be done sometimes in as little as five minutes. Um, but the PCR test is a lot more reliable than the antigen test. Both tests are going to have false positive because of the coronavirus. In fact, the, short, uh, the other coronaviruses, the ones that cause the cold and SARS-2 and even some other viruses that may cross-react, the higher the sensitivity. So if you're going to go meet the governor of Wisconsin, screw the president, I don't care. But if you're going to meet the governor of Wisconsin, you're going to have the most sensitive test possible. So there's no chance that anybody contagious is going to get near him which means you're going to have 10 to 20 false positives for every true positive. I don't care. I don't want the one true positive to get through. And that's the logic of the antigen tests is that you want to have really high sensitivity and lots of false positives. I can tell you that I have taken care, I'm taking care of one right now, a patient that I am absolutely certain has COVID virus and has two negative tests. But the word molecular, the word molecular test is synonymous with PCR, is it? Um, it may be synonymous with antigen, actually. Um, oh. And so I'm not certain. I have to, I'd have to look it up. Yeah, because that the one that was termed molecular was the six-hour turnaround. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably an antigen test, not PCR. I don't think any PCR test comes back in 24 hours, faster than 24 hours. Okay. What they do is when they do PCR, they put an enzyme in that makes copies of the virus that's there. So in your snot, if there's some virus there, they put enzymes that make copies. And that takes a certain amount of time at a given temperature. Then they put that into another test tube and do another round with fresh enzyme. And that takes a certain amount of time. So if the time of a cycle is two hours and you need 10 cycles, you're looking at 20 hours. Yeah. And then yeah. that's why it takes longer. Whereas an antigen test, you mix it, it binds, you give it a certain amount of time for mixing, five minutes, 10 minutes, six hours. 
So, but you said the and the antigen test has more false positivity, right? In general, yes. Okay. That's very helpful. That's Thank a generalization, you. Generalization. My pleasure. <laughs> So, Michael, um, going back to uh, the idea of having you and possibly Dr. Derry record messages for us, I was thinking about how should we um, how should we approach that in terms of because information keeps changing, should we plan on like once a month or two or um, to ha update a message or just play that by ear or what do you think about that? I'm happy to play it by ear through the end of the month. Like I said, I work on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Every other day is wide open. Um, uh, I think that we're not likely to know anything concrete for another week or two. And I think some message before Christmas is a good idea. Um, uh, we can also think, are there any particular updates um, that could be you know, here's, here's what the total, for those of you, any, uh, I'm jumping around, for those of you that do play Baroque and Beyond for a while, every, every week during the second hour, I was doing the latest summary of what I was hearing about coronaviruses, and Stephanie will testify, I was doing that before anybody else was talking about it. Um, uh, and I, I pretty much quit doing that because it's too damn depressing. Um, but some sort of synopsis of where we're at in your community, your state versus the whole country, that might be worth doing. But I would suggest yeah. kind of a standard standard format. Yes, yeah, Stephanie, the impression I got, and correct me if I'm wrong, Michael, was that you were suggesting that the first thing we do is maybe have a conversation between us and possibly with Mark Allen to get some sort of framework about how people should look at it. And I, I think maybe out of that conversation, they would come a better understanding about how to do the direct ask that Devine was, was making. Is, is that, isn't that what you were kind of saying, Michael? Well, yep, it that's seems, exactly it seems what I'm to saying. me, yeah, you know, like an, a kind of an overview of the national because, you know, there's so much noise out there versus, you know, just some plain down to earth facts. And then we could add on from that message, the more local stuff and, and um, yeah. do a combination. Is this uh, possibly yeah. a Sprouts or is this something outside that? Uh, it could I be, I mean, it's just like a 30 I, second. Um, yeah, message. I mean, my guess too is that the, if you, um, if you listen to noise filter, this is probably a lot. I have no doubt that this is, a, this is going to be covered in noise filter. Hmm. I, I'm sure. I mean, I can't imagine that they wouldn't go there. Yeah. They cover the latest in, I mean, we could do a Sprouts. I, I, I know that, um, you know, there's this show COVID Race and Democracy, which is a kind of a, a larger kind of version of the Sprouts idea, um, which is, and, and I know they're, they're the, the, the kind of executive producers of that, they're struggling right now with mm. coming up with a framework for dealing with vaccines and you know, I think they really want to take this on. We could do a Sprouts. I, I don't know. Depends if somebody wants to come forward and do that. Well, I was thinking, you know, when you said a conversation between Michael White and, and Mark, Mark Allen, is that the person? Yeah. Was that something that you were thinking we would do off air? Yeah, yeah, no. I because mean, because yeah. we could do something like that on air, you know, just a, a short conversation between a few knowledgeable people. You could, I, I guess it could, maybe it would good make good radio. Maybe it wouldn't. I don't know. Yeah. Well, I think it would, if it was recorded, we could make sure that it was decent. Yeah. radio. Sure. We could do that. I mean, I, I was thinking more of more shop talk. Yeah. Yeah. I, I get it. But I, it occurred to me that you could do something like that on the air. Yeah, you could. Uh, oh, Michael, this is, I, I know this is like stupid trivia, but I, I just can't. <laughs> this is a Midwestern question. The, 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 the hospital in Rod is St. Mary's, right? The hospital there? Well, there's two. St. Mary's is the main one, but there's more. There's actually two hospitals downtown. 
So, so the people that are, are there that are, are ill, are they local people or are they coming from all over the world like they usually do? I think they're mostly local. Uh, I think that they're not sending complicated COVID cases to Rochester. What has been done is the team. So for, I'm part of the Mayo Clinic Health System for everybody else. That's all the small hospitals in the upper west, Midwest in Minnesota, Iowa, and Wisconsin that are owned by Mayo, but not in Rochester. Our local hospital in La Crosse the docs in infectious disease and the specialists have been helping our docs manage our ICU patients remotely. So that the protocols that are put in place throughout the health system are the same as in Rochester. And there's, there's been a lot of improvements. And unfortunately, Alicia left. Um, one of the things that's going on is that the word that's on the street is African Americans Hispanics and to some degree Native Americans have more severe disease. They're more likely to wind up in the hospital. They're more likely to wind up in the ICU. And it's not necessarily obesity or diet um, or all the other things people like to point to. It may be genetic. We just don't know. Um, uh, and then a wow. question from James earlier. Um, the six feet plus mass seems to work for many. Otherwise, the infection rate would have been much higher, uh, would it not? And I, I think I'm having an ongoing argument with a whole lot of people because they point to where it wasn't working. And I said, this is imperfect, um, but it works a, much, a lot better than not doing it. And then if Stephanie will give me uh, the ability to share for a minute, uh, I'm going to uh, You should have the ability. Share. Okay. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to upload something because this is just, yeah. All right. Now let me move this to the side and then I'm going to do share screen. Click share screen. There we go. So this is the graphic that I like everybody. And on the left, you see all the coronavirus, all those green things. So here's physical distance, here's mask, here's hand hygiene, avoid touching your face. If crowded, limit your... Each of these is Swiss cheese and the virus can get through. The more layers of Swiss cheese you stack in a row, the overall better protection. And so this is my favorite model because there's personal responsibilities and shared responsibilities. There's things we can do as a society and people like vaccines, like quarantine and isolation, like uh, sensitive testing and tracing and all of those things. But there's things that we can do individually that help us. Every one of them has holes in it. Every one of them is imperfect. You stack enough of them in a row and you get cumulative benefit. Did you make this? No, it's from an article. Uh, I want to say it's from the New England Journal, but I've got the article that I, that I pulled it out of. I just, I love it. Um, let's see. Oh. Anyone else have any questions? Can you put that, that JPEG on uh, accessible to us, Michael? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, James, I will. James the one thing I got to check and see if there's a copyright that I have to pay attention to. I don't think it'll be a problem, but okay. I will follow up with Stephanie. And who knows? James. I might ignore the copyright. They can sue me if they want to. <laughs> uh, as a reminder, I'll post this video on, on our website tomorrow, too. So well, That's right. It's being recorded. Better. Wonderful. Yeah. So I can look stupid for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> So we're thinking the vaccine, uh, I have a friend in San Fran, they say they're, they're uh, ICU nurse, they're going to start getting the vaccine next week. And I don't know which vaccine they're going to, probably Pfizer, I would bet. But it is the Pfizer. If they're getting it next week, it is the Pfizer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And we're, we're told that we're going to have some vaccine arrive here next week. Uh, even Mayo hasn't told me when I'm going to get vaccinated because I'm retired. Here's my personal dilemma. I'm, am I going to get vaccinated at all? Cause I'm retiring in three weeks. Well, Michael, you don't count. You're just a dermatologist. You don't count. Um, or if I get the first shot, will they let me come back for the second shot when I'm no longer employed, but I'm retired. Oh. 
I'll work it out because I have friends in low places in the health department. Believe me, I'll get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Good. Friends in low places are important. Uh, I'm cooking up some got vaccine right. here in my lab. Don't worry about it. I got you covered. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have any questions today? I posted a link to a Forbes magazine article that talks about that Swiss cheese model. Oh, good. Yeah. Excellent. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for joining us today. This has been really wonderful to have your resourcefulness here for us. Um, yeah, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. It's my and great pleasure. Thank you for all of what you do. You, pe you people keep the radio stations going that are very important to a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so we'll look forward to talking with you and David, uh, Ursula and I, and um, see if we can put something together for people to download. Yeah, or, you know, there's other knowledgeable people here. Anybody, um, James, you had a lot of comments to make. If you would, you know, either say, you know, be available to join the conversation or just to right. send your thoughts. Yeah, please, yeah, Would send me an email. Okay, I will. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, hey, Joseph, I just learned about that reaction yesterday. I think that just started coming out, even though I think, you know, the people that are administering the, the people that were administering the tests for the vaccines knew about these reactions to the second dose. Uh, it's, it seems like those are just starting to come out to the public now. I, I learned about it from an article that came out in Science uh, last, or maybe Nature, one of the two, because I read both in the last couple of weeks, and it's very recent. It has not yeah. come out in the guidance I got from the state yet, but. Hmm. Oh. Well, I know people are busy, so um, if, if people need to get going, that is cool. I also have um some sound clips from paul smart in albany he he recorded about what some um, psas that he's done if you guys are interested uh, i could play those for you um i don't know what you think sure, what what are they about if you they're about they were, coronavirus oh, i'm sorry go ahead yeah and vaccines and stuff yeah, it's Paul, Paul is doing kind of what we were just talking about he's dropping in five minutes he replied to stephanie's announcement uh today and he kind of summed up what he's doing but i've talked to him on the phone about it as well he's he's trying to get local people to to do recordings uh because in his in albany he, he feels with wcaa um hearing local voices uh it carries more weight with the community and so in his case he's getting you know local folks to to do these and they're just short five minute pieces uh and he's playing them frequently like you know several times a day and he's just trying to basically i think he's trying to make it okay for people to to say yeah i'm going to get the vaccine i yeah, don't think he's put trying music to coerce underneath anybody, it but... to make it so, you know not so yeah yeah relaxing like no, it's not mm -hmm, mm -hmm. deal it's okay <laughs> different <laughs> different kinds of music i think he has a classical and a hip-hop and a... yeah <laughs> I, th I don't even think they're five minutes i think they're like maybe one to three um, oh, okay. Can I on? share again for one second? Yeah, sure. So uh, as she announced earlier, I'm on the board of the uh, La Crosse County Medical Society, and I had to beg and plead and nag, but I got people to agree that the La Crosse County Medical Society and the Wisconsin Medical Society, this is back in August, would put up billboards so that when the students came back, um, that would be everywhere. And so this is what I, one of several that I got us, we paid for it to, to put up. Um, and this is the one of the mock-ups. It's not the one I was actually, but it's the same message. Um, you know, we had a bunch of things that we designed to put up and, and spread. And mm -hmm. I think that these have the potential to modify behavior. Uh, I then went to the university and said, hey, this should be on your splash screen so that when the student, because everything is virtual now, so when the student powers up the computer and comes to UWL, it sees something like this. They didn't bite. 
Um, and so um, the other thing that I did was I started making masks early and started handing out masks. Um, I, had, I had to learn how to use my sewing machine. But what, what Dave is saying is that local voices make a difference. Um, and I couldn't agree more. Um, and constant reminders that are positive that are people are always aware of gradually modify behavior as well. And with that, I'll shut up. Well, I just, I would also say, I, I tend to agree with Davine as well, that, you know, the expert is the one that's more than 50 miles away. And uh, right. they're, they're, you know, experts have uh, a bit of cachet or, or weight as well. I think maybe a mixture of the, of the two, and it really depends yeah. on your community. Yeah, it depends on the community. In, I, in, in ours, I don't think anybody would listen to somebody. They have such a high opinion of themselves here. Sure, yeah. I, I don't think they would listen to somebody from outside. But for those short little drop-ins, like, hey, you know, I'm, uh, you know, get a firefighter or uh, a, an EMT or a paramedic. I'm going to get the shot as soon as it comes out or as soon as I can. And, you know, just, you know, little drop-ins of regular folks. Yeah, that's a good I mean, if I've if, seen it up close. I, well, yeah. I don't really understand what the point of it is because the, it's not even available. Well, it's, it's, I think it's preparing people. I mean, uh, so this, this is the thing that's driving me crazy. Um, is it a, a political position to say you're going to get a vaccine? It, it shouldn't be, I, in my opinion. And I don't think it, it is. It shouldn't I, be, but it is. Yeah, un unfortunately it is. So uh, tr is it, is it, you know, bad politics to try to convince your community to get vaccinated when they can? I don't know. I don't even know politically. I don't get it anymore. I mean. That's why the chair of the Alliance Party in Wisconsin, but that's a different discussion. <laughs> yeah. So I'll see you on Monday. Uh, all oh, right. That, uh, well, I'll just go ahead and share um, a couple of these. Yeah, I was, I was just going to work from home tomorrow. Right. I have my right. thing. Yeah. So I, I will too. I'll work down the basement. So if you need anything, call me. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. I think. Ruth, I'm. Oh, yeah. I've got to get that stuff for later. Okay. I'm going to try this here. Oh, hi, I, I've got the sound hooked up. Hopefully, it'll work. I'm going to leave now. One, two, three, okay. four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine. Can you guys hear that? Yeah. Yeah. For Thursday, December 3rd, Albany Victory Gardens Pandemic Produce Pickup at the Urban Farmers Garden Market, 2 to 5 p.m. at 579 Clinton Ave in West Hill, Albany. Albany School Board is at 6.30 p.m. Friday, December 4th, Capital District YMCA Drive Up Food Distribution, 5 to 7, 260 South Pearl Street, Albany. Every day, there are 12 step and similar programs, mostly meeting online at the moment. For further information, visit aahmbny.org slash meetings. Also, be sure and wear a mask whenever you're out and socially distance. Keep your community safe. Check on Facebook and YouTube as well as in Zoom for further info. Okay, that's the calendar one. And then he had, let's see here. Stephanie, I got to hit the road. I've got to go deal with a contractor. Okay. Is that Michael? Yep. Let's well, David. See you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. We'll be in touch. Deal. <laughs> uh, here is the holiday PSA. Hey, it's holiday season, but the pandemic is still with us and worsening. Please keep our community safe by continuing to practice social distancing. Wear a mask when with others outside your immediate family. Wash your hands a lot. Let's give each of us the gift of health in a new year. Be gentle. I like the positiveness of that. And then here's one more. Woo! 
137 new positive cases were reported overnight in Albany County, bringing total number to 6,160 to date. The number of hospitalizations has risen to 90. 84 were reported on yesterday, and of that number, one individual is below the age of 25. There were five new deaths, bringing total number of COVID-related deaths to 15 in one week, as reported out at the County Executive's coronavirus briefing. County Executive Dan McCoy emphasized these numbers continue to be alarming because we have yet to see the impact Thanksgiving Day weekend has had. Albany County Department of Health Commissioner Dr. Elizabeth Whelan echoed the county executive statement that a vaccine is coming shortly, but further stressed it will be some time before the general public will be able to receive it. Until then, the public is urged to embrace public health measures. We are heartened to know that there will be vaccine coming into the state shortly, but again, this vaccine is not going to be for the general public. Uh, we had a call with state DOH yesterday on uh, how the vaccine um, will start to be distributed. And as we all know, the likely first candidates for the vaccine will be our hospital providers, uh, our frontline workers who are working daily with COVID patients and our skilled nursing home facilities. <laughs> The fact that those are so short, there's a power to that because people are so overwhelmed with information, you know, of day to day, everything. Um, so just those small bits repeated, I think those will be effective. What do you guys think? Yeah, I agree. Okay. <laughs> um, does anyone else have any other thoughts today before we adjourn? Ursula, you're muted. Ursula, you're still muted. Okay, now I'm now. It's interesting, while we were listening to those, I, an email came in from the, the health department hmm. here in Florida County because they come on once a month to our, our morning show. She, she said, here's what we're going to talk about. Vaccines. <laughs> hmm. there you so, go. She, so this is her outline. She says, um, they, she want to talk about the phases of the vaccine plan, frontline healthcare workers and residents of long-term care facilities, like, like Michael was saying, long-term care facilities are working with pharmacies. Vaccine will be provided to hospitals for his hospital staff and public health is working with emergency medical services to, so in other words, they're saying that phase one, like Michael said, it's all for healthcare workers. Mm. And, then, mm. um, uh, and, then the, and then she talks about the first targeted population and identifying storage locations and training and then and then they wait for further guidance from state and federal levels and gather information and messaging to the public and timelines for delivery and priorities. So they're in some ways they're thinking, you know, I mean, they're, they're talking about the things that we kind of talked about today. Yeah. I wonder so, if you could get her after the, after she's on, for the regular show, get her to record some short 30 second. Oh, I'm, I'm sure they would. Yeah, happened. I'm sure she would. But I, I think it, you know, a conversation, you know, prior to talking to her to help us, you know, ask pointed questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But I, it seems like they're thinking down the generally the same lines as we are. But, you know, again, when they say they're looking to the state and federal agencies for guidance, what, what exactly does that mean? Yeah, right. Who in the state mm -hmm. is giving yeah, them right. guidance? Yeah, yeah. So far, I was done a pretty bad job of just about everything. Mm. Yeah, there's some people in our state I don't want to listen to. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> However, our attorney general did not sue the state of... Uh, yeah, oh, good got for, that going for good us. Good for them. 
<laughs> At least he's still got his head on straight. Thank God. I know he's yeah. quitting, but he's still here and he did not sign on. I'll take it. I mean, didn't the, didn't the Supreme Court basically tell everybody to like go away? Didn't they already say that? Am I? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought too. I mean, it basically was one sentence that's more or less said, go to hell, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why? Yeah. I don't, what, what the hell? You know, like now they're coming back with this. It's just, I, it just boggles my mind. Anyway, sorry. I just. <laughs> <laughs> We're all thinking it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God we've still got an attorney general who's, who's thinking straight. Yeah. I need oh, to get that, going. I bet I'll see some everybody. of you tonight at, at, at seven. seven oh yes, Central there's time. the 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 window. PRC, yeah. Openings, yeah, at seven Central, eight Eastern. That's what I'm shooting for. Yeah. What's happening? I don't. I'm totally out of there's the. There's the GRC meeting on um, Windows for 2021. Michael Brown's going to talk about. Uh, the timing of the window, and I don't know what else he's going to talk about, but I'm eager to hear. Yeah. So there's that. So anyway, thank you, everybody. The, the, the Zoom invo invite is in uh, the GRC. Actually, I think Sharon yeah. posted it to uh, station managers as well as the GRC mailing list. Yes. Yep. It is on both. Okay. So maybe we'll see you there. Yeah. All right. Thanks for joining. Thanks for pulling this together. This is good. Yeah, it's thank so you. great so to much. have you guys. And thanks Glad James you're feeling for better, us. Eugene. Yes, and thank you, Eugene, for still being there and um, being healthy. <laughs> Staying alive. Well, I'm, almost, I'm almost certain it was a false positive now that really? it, it seems to have been the anti test uh, that I got. Yeah. Well, that's well, good. whatever. My, I'm glad you're healthy. Even though my doctor told me, you got the virus. There's no doubt about it. You got the virus, you know. We see what we want to see. Don't we? <laughs> yeah. It's a roller coaster. Confirmation bias. Well, I'm sure you had the had it emotionally. That was probably oh. a little bit of a roller Oh yeah. For sure. <laughs> so. Had it changed my life for 10 days. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, we'll see everybody uh soon. If you have any ideas for our um little PSAs, send me an email and we'll, we'll see you again soon. Take care. See y'all. Thanks. Thanks Stephanie. Thank you, Stephanie. Yep. You bet.